guilty. First-degree murder. That's the one thing that Jody Arias' jury can agree on. Under that dark hair and those bookish glasses, the mind of a murderer. But does she deserve to die for the way she killed her ex-boyfriend? The jury is still deliberating, but the now convicted killer sat down one-on-one -on -one with ABC's Ryan Owens as she contemplates her fate. Jody Arias speaks. Ladies and gentlemen, I have received your note indicating that you are unable to come to a unanimous decision. After just two hours of deliberating whether Jody Arias should live or die, the jury of eight men and four women said they were deadlocked. But almost five months into this, the judge wasn't about to accept that. Please go back to the jury room and continue deliberating. You are excused. The jury spent another five hours deliberating today and will be back at it again tomorrow. They already convicted Arias of the first degree murder of her ex-boyfriend Travis Alexander. Guilty. The 30-year-old Mormon businessman was stabbed 27 times, his throat was slit from ear to ear, and he was shot in the face. Tuesday, Arias spoke to the jury one last time to beg for her life. To this day, I can hardly believe I was capable of such violence. Even though the convicted killer has repeatedly said she'd rather die than spend her life in prison, when it really counted, she changed her tune. She claims to spare her family. But as I stand here now, I can't in good conscience ask you to sentence me to death because of them. Just hours after her final plea for mercy, we found out the 32-year-old wasn't done talking. She sat down with me for a 40-minute jailhouse interview Tuesday night. You said today you want to give Travis's family closure. You know they want you dead, so why don't you give them that closure? What do you mean by that? Why don't I kill myself? Is that what you're asking? No, why don't you accept the fate of the death penalty if you know that's what they want? If you truly care about their closure? I've caused them a lot of pain. I've caused my family a lot of pain. And I think that by asking for death, I'm only going to cause more pain to my family. Why didn't you apologize to them? I did apologize to them. You never said, I'm sorry. I said that I said that I'm sorry, that I'll never be able to make up for what I did, and that I can never replace their loss. But you didn't use the word, I'm sorry. Well, then I'm sorry I didn't say that, because certainly I am sorry. I think, in a sense, I, the, the words, I'm sorry, just seem meaningless, especially since nobody believes what I'm saying anyway. You said it right there, no one believes a word out of your mouth. Why do you keep talking? Because I know that I'm not just, I've lied before, that doesn't mean that I'm a liar by definition, by character. To a lot of people, they think this switch from I want to die to now I want to live is just another lie from Jody Arias. I don't know what that means. Was I lying when I said I want to die or was I lying when I say please spare my life, you know? Um, whatever happens, I'm just going to take it and deal with it. You've said that sort of thing a lot before, including right after you were arrested. You said, my goodness, if I did something this horrible to Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. Right. You did it. So what changed? My family changed my mind. Some of Arias' last words to the jury were downright bizarre. She argued for life in prison by essentially presenting a political platform for the rest of her life behind bars. There are many things I can do to affect positive change and contribute in a meaningful way. In prison, there are programs I can start and people I can help. She almost sounded like she was running for student council president. She told the jury she wanted to start a recycling program in prison, a book club, Spanish lessons for other inmates. This is the t-shirt. She was kind enough to bring uh, a sample of the t-shirt she designed to, to raise money support. for domestic Not violence victims. She wants to keep selling those. Pictures. Oh, and she told the jury if she lives, she can keep donating her hair to cancer patients who need wigs. In your final statement today, you talked about all sorts of things you might be able to do in prison. Teach other prisoners Spanish, donate more of your hair, um, start a recycling program. Do you know how trivial that sounded in the face of what you did? Well, there isn't a whole lot that I know about prison. And these are only things that I'm able to ascertain from having never been there. So I believe that when I get there, I will find ways, better ways to contribute and pay back. But can't you grow out your hair on death row and donate it? Yeah, um, it'll be less wigs if I get executed. I mean, I know that sounds trivial. It but does. That's what. That's the only way that I can contribute. I'm limited. I'm going off to prison. I can't. There are so many things that I'm no longer going to do. So, in a sense, I was grasping at straws. But these are things that I can do. And at this point, that's what I'm holding on to. If you were on that jury, 
and you had heard what they have heard, would you kill you? I don't believe in capital punishment, um, so the answer would be no. In this penalty phase, the jury heard from no character witnesses for Jody. But my fondest memories with him. No friends, no family, even though her mother has been in court every day of the almost five-month trial. One thing that surprised a lot of people is that no one from your family got up to say anything nice about you when you were facing the possibility of the death penalty. Well, that was a defense decision and, the and one that I was somewhat in agreement with. My mother wanted to. She had a letter written out that she wanted to read, and my dad was fired up. He wanted to talk, and my defense team didn't call either of them. But the impact of that is that you've lived on this planet for 32 years, and you have no one other than yourself to come up and vouch for your character as a person when you're facing death. Well, I did have people, and they were not called. I loved Travis, and I looked up to him. At one point, he was the world to me. One of the other things you did say today is, look, I don't want to drag Travis's name through the mud. And at the same time you say that, you were up on that stand accusing him of abusing you and being a pedophile and all sorts of terribly awful things. What does that say about the kind of person that you are? That I was truthful. I didn't want to do it, but I was obligated to do it. I was under oath. So the only other option was to lie and say he was perfect. And to people who say you shot him, you stabbed him, you slit his throat, and then you killed him a fourth time when he was already dead by making up things about him to ruin his reputation, you say what? Nothing was made up. Nothing was made up at all. I mean, it was a defense strategy for me to take the stand, and once I was on the stand, I was obligated to answer the questions that were posed to me. And that's what I did. But you know no one believes you, right? That's not true. Maybe a majority of people don't, but I know plenty of people that believe me. If you get life in prison, you could conceivably get out someday. Do you deserve freedom? All I know is that if I were given freedom again, I would handle it very, very responsibly. So you think people should feel safe if Jody Arias is out of these four walls at some point? I think so, yes. If you're not abusing me and attacking me and threatening to kill my life, there's no reason to fear. You really are still sticking with that story? It's not a story. It's the reality. And it's unfortunate, but it is the reality. Okay. I didn't know that you were a hater when you came to interview me. Arias seems surprised by the tough questions. By her own admission, she lives in a bubble behind bars. We talked to a lot of your friends, some of whom said that Jody is the most hated woman in America right now. Do you feel that? No, I don't feel it in here. I'm so um, incubated in here. I hear things, and you know, a lot of what gets to me is the positive. They filter out the negatives. But you did know there were hundreds of people cheering outside of the courthouse when you were convicted. I did hear of that, yes. And what do you make of that? I don't know. I really don't. A lot has been made about your appearance and your change in appearance. Was going from blonde bombshell to sort of the mousy church librarian look in court, was that a defense strategy? Was that your idea? What was that? No, they don't sell Clairol hair dye in jail. So this is my natural hair color. But there was more than just the hair color. The glasses, overall the demeanor is very different than the person that you were before this crime happened. What about that? Well, this is a court of law. It's not a place to go and act crazy, or well, I shouldn't use that term, but it's not a place to go and just let loose. It's a court of law. And in that court of law, the jury will resume its work tomorrow. Will Jody Arias spend her life in prison or be sent to death row, where there are no more lights, no more cameras, and no more TV interviews, which just might be the ultimate punishment for her? I'm Ryan Owens for Nightline in Phoenix.